stories. Readouts are at 100% efficiency. The sensors in a space suit are all working uh, perfectly. You guys. We are going to learn so much about how the human body copes in outer space. Houston, we have a problem. Sorry, you guys, I'm going to have to interrupt you here. Hang on, Alan, won't be long now. Now, all the electrodes are still attached to his body, correct? Uh, see, when we first talked about this whole going into space caboodle, we said it was going to take 15 minutes, so, uh, I got a bit of a situation in the bladder department. Yeah, Alan, that's right. Uh, we had to delay because of the weather, but we should be ready to launch soon, so just, uh, sit tight. Sit tight. That is great advice. Thank you, Phil. But you see, the thing is, I didn't think it'd take this long, so, uh, I didn't go. Sorry. Go, go where? To the little astronaut's room. Y you want to go to the bathroom? I really, really, really need the toilet. I mean, heavens to Betsy, I've been in here for five hours. Look, we can't stop the mission now, Alan, so just think of something. You're an astronaut. Ten. Final checks, all Nine. 27 radars are working perfectly. Six. No, 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 what's mission. going on? Abort. No, no, mission. no, no, the suit sensors are short circuiting. Alan, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but we've had a malfunction, so we might have to abort. Uh, Whoa. Well. Alan? Did you go pee pee? It's okay, you guys. I am ready for takeoff. Hello, I am Valentina Tereshkova, proud Russian and first lady to go into space. But what happened during my three day orbit of planet Earth? Did I, A, get terrible nosebleeds, B, couldn't stop sneezing, C, kept being sick? And the answer is C. In space, many cosmonauts feel sick from lack of gravity. I did much puking and also leg hurt and couldn't leave seat for three days and nearly died when orbit calculations wrong and nose smashed on helmet and then nearly drowned when parachute land near big leg. But apart from that, best fun ever. Highly recommend two vertical thumbs. Ha, I'm Neil Armstrong. And I'm here to tell you the secret behind my remarkable weight loss. It's being on the moon. I went from being the weight of a normal man to weighing virtually nothing. And now you can too. All you need to do is follow my unique Apollo 11 weight loss program. Here's me before landing on the moon. And here's me after. An amazing 83% lighter. Here's how it works. The gravity on the moon is much less than the gravity on the Earth, which means that when you walk on the moon, you feel far, far lighter. You'll be able to bound around like an overexcited kangaroo. Woo! Here's what you'll need. A rocket, just like mine, the Saturn V. It needs to be taller than a 36-story building and weigh about the same as 400 elephants. When you first arrive on the surface of the moon, make sure you're the first person out of the lunar module. If you're the first man on the moon, everyone will remember your name. Take this guy. He came out second, and his name is... It's gone. Buzz. Buzz Aldrin. His name is Baz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin. You see what I mean? You also need something cool to say when you first walk on the moon. I'd recommend something like this. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Shouldn't it be, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind? Well, when you're the first man to walk on the moon, maybe you could try that. Oh, sorry, my mistake. I was the first man on the moon, Baz. Buzz! And don't forget to plant your American flag. That'll really annoy the Ruskies. Try my Apollo 11 weight loss program. It's mine too. It's not rocket science. Technically it is. Who asked you, Baz? Buzz! 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 You got a wasp in there with you? What? He hates it when I say that. Hello and welcome to the news at when, when, around 70 years ago, when the United States of America and the Soviet Union, centered around modern-day Russia, decided to try and settle the growing argument over who was superior in a way that was quite literally out of this world. Here with more details on this starry story is our very own space cadet Bob Hale with the Space Race Report. Bob. Thank you, Sam. Well, the year is 1945, World War II has just ended, and after years of having to be battle buddies, America and the Soviet Union can now finally embrace the fact that they don't much like each other. You see, these two superpowers run their countries in very different ways, called chalk and cheese. Uh, 
I mean communism and capitalism. So have grown to distrust each other intensely. But luckily, both of them captured some of the German rocket scientists who built Hitler's wartime missiles, which suggests a rather exciting way to settle which superpower is best. Rocket back jousting! No? OK, then how about using missile technology to put a man into space? Yes, the space race is on with an early lead going to America, who, to find out if it's possible for living creatures to survive space travel, start firing monkey dogs, mice and rhinos into outer space. Though not rhinos. And with the Soviets following suit, soon loads of animals are sent off into starry skies, with many of them never coming back. I guess they liked it up there. Or the, what? Oh, right. Rest in peace, guys. Anyway, now the race really starts hotting up as both sides rush towards the next major milestone, putting a man-made craft into orbit around the Earth, with the points this time going to the Soviets. Yes, in 1957, Sputnik 1, a radio beacon the size of a beach ball, becomes the thank you. Really helpful, honestly. Yes, Sputnik becomes the first ever satellite, but America's not far behind. And in 1958, they launch Explorer 1, which is about the size of a grapefruit. Don't even think about it. And while it's even Stevens score-wise, the Soviets are now on a roll. They send an unmanned rocket right around the moon, launch a probe to photograph its surface, and in 1961, after successful tests using a dummy, yes, very funny, Russia's Yuri Gagarin becomes the first ever man in space, and America starts getting pretty sick of second place. So, in 1961, US President John F. Kennedy announces that America will attempt the impossible, to put a man on the moon. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. The exact same reason why I keep trying to set the clock on my oven. So, a new series of rockets it's known as the Apollo program are dedicated to mooning. Uh, I mean, the moon landing. But disaster strikes when a fire during launch simulation kills the crew of Apollo 1, meaning Apollos 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 become unmanned flights to perfect the design. Until finally, in 1968, the USA gets some badly needed points when the crew of Apollo 8 become the first men in history to orbit the moon. And just one year later, America is finally ready to do what mankind has always dreamt of, teaching a pig to tap dance. Huh? Oh, moon landing. That makes more sense with all of this. I see. Yeah, no, 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 fine. So, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong climb aboard Apollo 11 with the aim of beating the Soviets once and for all. Their mission is simple fly to the moon, land on the moon, walk on the moon, leave the moon, fly home, and Bob's your uncle, though only if you're my nephews. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Well, since the navigation computer was about as powerful as a chip inside a modern toaster, I'd say pretty much anything. But the date's been set, the cameras are primed, and the eyes of the world watch with bated breath, which is difficult for eyes, as on July the 20th, 1969, the Lunar Module Eagle separates from the Command Module Columbia and... Lands on the moon! Yes, the space race is finally won! A scoreboard shattering victory to the US of A as Neil Armstrong takes one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. The Soviets accept defeat, wave goodbye to a moon they never reached, and turn their attention to building space stations, leaving America to build a moon colony with a burger bar and a coffee shop, right? Wrong! In fact, only 12 people ever set foot on the moon, and no one's been there since 1972. A tragic oversight that I'm going to rectify right now. Yes, it's time to take one small step for Bob Hale, but one giant leap for the good people at Bob Hale Space Rocket Industries. Goodbye, Sam. I've always loved you. Will you wait for me? No. Well, I'm not going then. Fine. The Soviet Russians were way ahead of our American Apollo space program, and we needed to up our game. So we invested in some incredibly powerful computers that could calculate the complicated mathematics needed to get manned rockets to the moon and back. But these computers were kind of different to the ones you're thinking of. When you're planning to put a man on the moon, you need a computer that can do high-speed, complex calculations and precise rocket trajectories. You need the latest technology from NASA. Just ask the experts. Hi, Buzz Aldrin, astronaut. We rocket jockeys don't know much about computers, but this is one computer I trust. And I know the future when I see it. The future of computers is now. The future is I, Katherine Johnson. Welcome to me, Katherine Johnson, NASA computer. Tell Buzz if he uses these settings, he's going to hit the sun. Sorry, where do I plug in the keyboard? Well, I'm not that kind of computer. Computer is my job title. Oh, so you don't work out complex algorithms and baffling calculations at super high speeds? Hmm. Well, I guess I am that kind of computer. Great. So where do I plug in the keyboard? The I, Katherine Johnson, putting the person in personal computing. Don't you even think about it. Houston, this is Apollo 10. We are now orbiting the moon at a distance of 8.4 nautical miles. 
Uh, Commander, the instruments are picking something up. It's it's pretty close by. What? A an asteroid. Ah, this thing is made of organic matter. Guys, it's it's ten feet away. I can't see it. Where, where is it? Eight feet. I've sealed all the airlocks. Five feet. Guys, I don't want to worry you, but it's inside the ship. I don't want to die! <laughs> Sensors are reading high levels of carbon, water, and sweet corn. I have a visual! What is it, Captain Cernan? It's a number two, sir. This is no time to talk in code, Cernan. It's a, uh, a, 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 a brown dwarf, a, 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 a pooper nova, a sticky space invader. It's a big pole! Oh, get it away from me! Apollo 10, is everything okay? Houston, we have a problem. There's a... A poo-poo floating in the cockpit. I think there's a problem with the communication system. Oh. It sounded like you said there's a, a poo-poo floating in the cockpit. No, no, that's what I said. Uh, someone clearly left this hatch on their spacesuit open. Don't blow it here. Well, you're on your own with that, Apollo 10. There's nothing we can do about that from here. Okay, Young, catch it in a napkin. Why me? I didn't do it. Doesn't look like one of mine. Young. This is an order. Well done, Young. That was one small poo for man, one giant catch for mankind. Definitely one for the captain's log, sir. Horrible history.